Hello everyone and welcome to Henry Wildberry TV. Today I'm going to tell you all about my new bike. But first, let me change. Hold on. That's better. So like I said, today what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about my new bike. This is a 1990s, early 1990s, Colnago lugged steel bike. It is constructed with Columbus SL tubing. And I acquired this bike frame through a pretty elaborate series of events. And that's what we're gonna talk about today in this video. I know this video has been a long time coming. This bike has been evolving with me for a while. And I've made several videos about it already. But today what I wanna do is talk about the whole story behind this bike. So, it's gonna be a little bit of a long one, but hang with me, and uh, hopefully this will be interesting for some of you out there. So, this bike frame was originally purchased by a fellow named, a gentleman, we'll say, named Max. And he lives in Sonoma County, which is in Northern California, in a town called Santa Rosa. And he purchased this bike as a new old stock sometime around 2000 to 2002, somewhere in there. And new old stock is just a frame that was built in the 90s but never found an owner. So it was sitting in a bike shop or it was just somewhere and no one had ridden it yet. So it was sold as a new bike even though it was now probably 10 years old. So Max purchased it as an online uh, purchase and when he re received it, he built it up and took it out and rode it a little bit quickly to find out that it was a little too small or a little too big for him. So he decided to donate it or give it away to somebody that he thought would be able to use it and actually get, get some use out of it. So he went over to his local bike shop, which is called the Bike Peddler. Uh, you can see the stickers on the frame. And he gave it to a fellow named Chris Wells. Chris was a head mechanic there at the Bike Peddler. And he thought that Chris would be a perfect candidate for this bike. Chris is a little taller and Chris also has a real affinity for, you know, classic Italian steel racing bikes such as this one. So Chris happily accepted it and built it up into this really awesome racing bike, uh, only to, to discover that for him, 
the frame was too small. So he decided to give it to this other mechanic that was working at the Bike Peddler, a junior mechanic who was kind of getting started, younger guy, really into racing, thought, well, maybe he would benefit from this classic Italian steel bike. So he accepted it, and he was the guy that rode this bike for a really, really, really long time. He ended up taking the bike over to Europe, where he toured throughout all of uh, Western Europe, all through the mountains. Uh, he back, you know, he toured on it with his stuff. He stayed at hostels. He went all over East, uh, Western Europe on this bike, and uh, he quit his job. You know, he was basically traveling on by bike. He somehow decided to ditch the original steel fork that came with it and swapped it out for a modern carbon fiber fork with a carbon steer. That was something that was starting to become um, popular at the time. The allure of carbon being lighter and stiffer, it attracted him to that fork. So somehow we lost the original fork. So if anyone out there knows where it is, let me know in the comments. But anyway, so he ditches the carbon or ditches the steel fork for a carbon fork, continues to ride the bike, gets really into bike racing, and then decides to come back to the US. So he flew back over to the US, but this time he landed in Florida, where he lived in Florida for several years, still riding this bike. He did all alley cat races, crits, he was sketching with this bike, he was doing all the stuff you see in Florida that the cyclists there like to do. He did it all on this bike. And then after a couple years of riding all the flatlands, he decided Florida wasn't for him. So he got back on his bike, packed it up with his stuff, and rode it all the way back to the west coast here um, in beautiful, hilly Sonoma County. He came back with the bike, he went back to the bike peddler, and he said, went right back to Chris, who's still working there at the time, and still works there to this day, Chris, this bike you gave me, it's been amazing. I've traveled Europe. I've gone all over the Florida panhandle. I've toured all the way back from Florida to here. I've gotten my use out of it. I feel very fortunate to have used it, but I want to pass it on to someone else. I'm getting a different bike, a new bike, but I want to see this go to somebody that's going to ride it. So Chris said, oh, okay, great. You know, So he took it home put it in his garage and he had it there for quite a long time. Now I did a video about this where I met up with Chris and we exchanged frames. So if you want to see that video, I'll put a link to that also. But to get back to the story, so this frame was sitting in Chris's garage. Now we need to go to the other parallel story that was happening simultaneous to all of these events going back to 2004 when a man named Peter Cracknell, some of you out there watching this will know who I'm talking about, began his cycling career. I say a career, but his cycling passion. Sometime around 2004, this man named Peter Cracknell, who was English from the country of England, immigrated to New York, and then from New York moved to the West Coast for jobs. He moved to Marin County, California, which is the home of the mountain bike, Many of you know that area. It's just north of San Francisco. So anyway, he moved to there, got his job in San Francisco, and noticed there was all these people out every weekend riding bicycles. And so he, he kind of got interested in cycling. He was a little bit on the older side. He was in his probably early to mid-30s and decided he was going to try out bicycle riding for himself. So he went down to his local bike shop there in Marin County, and he bought the cheapest road bike you could get. Flat pedals, you know, the cheapest component group, probably made out of some hydroformed aluminum, crappy wheels, you know, basic road bike that you're gonna get at the bottom end of the price spectrum. But of course, you gotta start somewhere. So Peter gets going on this newfound adventure of his cycling, he starts riding in Marin, and he starts developing his riding skill pretty quickly and people start to take notice there. And soon he's being invited to come join the club rides. Now Peter's kind of at that time a bit anti-cycling in the sense of doesn't want to wear the Lycra and the kit and the quirky looking helmets and the funny shoes with the clips. So he sticks to his flat pedals and his running shorts 
and he just gets a basic helmet and some gloves. That's his riding outfit. And he starts showing up at these big group rides where everyone's decked out in full kit. They've got their racing carbon fiber racing bikes, and he shows up on this, uh, you know, four or $500 entry level road bike with flat pedals. And he begins to start dropping everyone. And they're like, who is this guy? And how, how is he beating us? You know, these are guys that have been riding for years. They've been training. They, there were, some of them were triathletes. Some of them are road racers. Some of them are crit racers. And here's this guy with flat pedals and running shorts, dropping them on the climbs. So he became pretty notorious. And uh, a couple of the guys encouraged Peter to try his hand at bike racing. And Peter really wasn't the best bike handler. So bike racing probably wasn't really a good suggestion for him early on. But anyway, he took their advice and he signed up for his first uh, bike race. So there's some local racing here in Northern California. You know, you've probably seen some of it on uh, NorCal Cycling's channel. You've probably seen it on uh, EJ uh, Training channel. These are local guys that are bike racers. You probably watch some of their videos. If you don't, check them out. They're really good videos. They, they're, they're covering bike racing, so it's very specific. But anyway, um, so Peter goes to what is called, it's a, it's a time trial race. So this is a race where you race a clock. You don't race in a peloton. You just individually go out and do your hardest effort over a specific course for a specific time. Or you have, you have to see who does it in the shortest amount of time. So anyway, he signs up, NorCal, gets his Cat 5 license, goes to the race. A friend of his says, hey, Peter, you know, you got, if you're going to do a time trial, you need arrow bars. He's like, what are those? He's like, here, let me let you borrow mine. So he gets the clip on arrow bars and he gets his flat pedals, his running shorts, and his dork lid on. And he goes to do uh, his first time trial race. And when he's telling me the story, he says that, you know, he shows up there and everybody's warming up on trainers. He doesn't have one of those. He's, he's just completely out of place, but he lines up for his time slot, cat five, does his right race. And, uh, sure enough, he beats, he wins the cat five race. And what was even really more impressive about this story was that not only did he win the cat five race, he also set the fastest time of the day, even among the pros of the Cat 1s and the Cat 2s. So right then, I think people realize that this guy is a real natural at this. And so pretty soon, you know, he's getting invited to all the big rides and he slowly adopts the cycling lifestyle. And then he gets, you know, gets a fancy bike, gets the carbon and all that. And he really enjoys it and he keeps racing and he keeps winning all the time trial races and he rides through Marin County on his, you know, training rides. He sets all the KOMs on all the big climbs. I remember one time spinning through or paging through his Strava account, just, just admiring page after page after page of Strava KOMs. Just like, wow, this guy is so, so amazing. I mean, just on a level that most of us only dream to be on. And so he gets invited, or he, he meets this frame builder who's sort of spending part-time in Marin and I think part-time in Colorado. And he, Peter meets this guy and he says, hey, you know, I've always really wanted, like, I want to try what a classic steel, you know, lugged bike is like. And this guy says, hey, I can, you know, build one for you. Now, Peter is really tall. He's uh, six foot four. When he's in his prime weight, he was probably around 210, 210 pounds. So he's a big guy. And finding a bike frame to fit him was always a challenge. So anyway, this custom frame builder said, you know what, I can build you a frame. So he built him a lugged steel frame with oversized tubing, super stiff, designed for racing, but just, but more with classic lines, classic geometry, level top tube. And Peter's like, cool, this is gonna be great. So they get it, they put a carbon fiber fork on it, you know, that's the thing, right? Um, and so he starts riding that bike once in a while. And it's kind of more of his novelty bike. Well, then he asks this frame builder, hey, you know, I really like this lug bike. Could you build me a fillet braised bike? So he commissions this frame builder again. His name is Taylor. The last name is Taylor. So he has Taylor uh, custom frame, custom build him a fillet braised frame. Similar geometry, really tall head tube. You know, Peter's a tall guy. So long top tube 
super long stem. I mean, the stem he was running, I think it was like a 140. Anyway, I still have the stem here in my garage and we'll get to why I have that here. Anyway, um, so he gets these two bikes built. Now, later on, um, Peter decides to, to move out of Marin County and he moves out to the, up to the north coast of Sonoma County. And one day, a friend of mine, Jake, calls and says, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I don't know. I'm going to go for a bike ride. He goes, hey, do you want to join me on a group, on a little group ride? And I was like, yeah, sure. Where do you want to meet? So he told me where to meet and what time. So I go down there. I'm riding up and I see this guy. I see a bike leaning against the cafe wall and I see this tall silhouette standing there. And I'm like, that guy looks really familiar to me. And so I roll up. Sure enough, it's this guy, Peter. Now I knew Peter even though he didn't really know me that well, but I used to ride in Marin County years ago, back when he was doing a lot of riding. And I used to ride on his group rides and usually I was on the back because he, and he was usually on the front pulling everyone. And so I had really knew who he was because he was just notorious in those group rides. So anyway, I roll up and I'm like, that looks like that guy from Marin County. So sure enough, I'm like, oh, but he's, he must just be out here riding today. So I pull up and he goes, hi, how are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm good. And he goes, are you joining the group ride today? And I said, uh, group ride? And he goes, I go, well, I'm supposed to meet my friend Jake here. He goes, yeah, Jake, I'm meeting him here too. And I was like, oh, so you're on the ride. <laughs> and he's, he said, yeah, my name's Peter Cracknell. And what's your name? You know, it's really friendly, really just a really nice person. And so we started chatting and I go, yeah, I actually know you. I used, and I explained, I used to ride Marin. I used to see him on the ride. So you know, I made the connection right away. Anyway, long story short, we became good friends. We used to ride together all the time. And uh, he was such a fun person to ride with. He could ride at any pace. He's very, you know, could ride ca casual conversation pace. He was never about trying to drop everyone. Uh, he just enjoyed being on the bike. He just really loved, really, really loved cycling. And so later on, he uh, got diagnosed with, with cancer. I talked about that on this channel on a few videos and eventually um, he passed away, unfortunately. So rest in peace, Peter. Um, but we're carrying on your, your legacy here. So hopefully you're somewhere watching. But anyway, um, so he had these two bikes that he had commissioned. One of them he found a, a buyer for and he sold it. And that was the Philip Raced bike. But he still had the lugged bike and he couldn't find anyone to take it. And I would have loved to take it because it's a beautiful bike, but it's just too big for me. So this frame is, uh, it has double oversized tubing, uh, down tube and top tube. It was designed for an inch and an eighth threadless steer. It's got an English threaded bottom bracket. It has this really nice braze on uh, for the front derailleur. It's a road bike, so it fits up to like 28 millimeter wide, 700 C tires. It has vertical dropouts with a replaceable derailleur hanger. And he was running out of time when this happened. He just couldn't find anyone. He had all, a lot of other things to deal with, obviously. The bike was kind of becoming the last thing. So I said, look, I'll take care of it for you, Peter. So I got the bike and took it home and I had it sitting around for quite a while. And I kept thinking, who, I want to give this bike, I want to get this bike to somebody that's really going to use it. I know Peter built this bike as his novelty, but he, but he would want someone to ride it. He wants someone to actually use this thing. Um, so I kept thinking, who could this bike go to? And anyway, I thought, well, you know, in the meantime, I can take, I'll use the, I'll get, I'll just strip it down to the frame and I'll use all the parts. So I built Miss Cool's road bike with a lot of the components. It had a lot of campy components on it. Um, I sold some of the little bits and pieces like the crank. It had a huge crank on it. I mean, his legs were huge. So I was like, no one, I, I, I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to get it down to the frame and then sell the frame to somebody that could build it up the way they wanted to. So anyway, all the parts kind of dispersed themselves into my garage and onto other bikes and stuff like that. And then one day um, I head over to Santa Rosa. I need to get some stuff at the bike shop and I go into the bike shop and I go to bike peddler and Chris is working. And we start talking about his new gravel bike. He just got this C Jeremy Seasip custom titanium gravel bike and he's just so thrilled with it. We're going over it, we're looking at it and I'm staring at the head tube and I'm like, that is a big head tube. This guy's, 
pretty tall. And I said, you know what? So I started thinking about it. I'm like, hey, Chris. Um, and I said, you know, he's got retro tech bikes. He's got lots of classic bikes. And so I could tell he has an appreciation for this. So I said, hey, Chris, I think I have a bike frame you might be interested in. Next time I come into town, I'm going to bring it with me. And he said, oh, okay. You know, so I told him a little bit about it. And then that was it. And so I left. And about, I don't know, it was probably about two months later, Miss Cools and I are riding around in Santa Rosa and we're going through the neighborhood and all of a sudden around the corner, here comes Chris on his bike, you know, big smile. Hey, Chris, what's up? You know, so we stop, we're chatting in the road and he goes, hey, uh, you know, remember that bike frame you, met, you mentioned to me a few months ago? And I go, oh, I'm so sorry. I f completely forgot about that. I meant to bring it in sooner, but I, I, it just slipped my mind. And he goes, well, you know, I was thinking about that frame and he goes, you know, I, I might have a frame that would, that might work for you. So maybe we could work out some kind of a trade. And I was like, oh, okay. I hadn't thought about doing a trade. I was actually just going to give this frame to Chris because I just thought he'd be a great person to have it. And I just want to see it go to a, a good home. And plus I had taken all the parts off of it already. So, you know, I already got what I needed from it. And, you know, I wanted him, I want the frame to get going to somebody who can really use it. So anyway, I said, okay, cool. Well, send me some photos of it. And I said, well, what is it? And he goes, well, it's a Colnago and I'll, and I'll send you some photos of it. And I was like, okay, cool. So that night I got home, he forwarded some photos to me and it looked like it was red and white in the photos. And I was like, oh, red and white Colnago. Okay. Well, that's fine. You know, red's not my favorite color, but I can live with it. So I said, and I was more concerned about the geometry. I was, he said it was a little big. It might be a little big for you, but it, but it might work. And I was like, well, let's try it. So I did the video. We swapped the frame so you guys can go see all that. So anyway, that is how I ended up with this bike frame. But there's an important thing I left out of this story. And that is the fork. So when Chris gave me the bike, he didn't have a fork for it. And when I asked him about it, he said, told me the story about the bike mechanic and how, you know, the guy got rid of the fork, sadly, and put a carbon fork on it. You know, that was the thing then. People thought that that was going to make their ride more performance oriented or whatever. But anyway, so we lost the original fork. So I said, okay, well, no problem. You know, I'm giving him a frame without a fork. So I guess it's still, you know, it's an even trade. And besides, I was going to give him the frame anyways. So, so I, I didn't tell him that either. So he's, if he's watching this video, um, you know, he could have had both these bikes still. But anyway, I got it. So I got the Colnago. So I've been, I spent months afterwards searching eBay, trying to find an original Columbus Steel Colnago fork. I wanted the original, but at this time frame, this era, these bikes came with were, which were uh, mostly straight bladed forks. And uh, Ernesto Colnago, the guy that you know started, the, who's this bike company's named after, worked with uh, worked with uh, a performance uh, car manufacturer, Ferrari, to develop that straight blade fork, thinking that there was some advantages to a straight blade fork, even though there's a little bit of a fork rake in it, but it's still a straight blade. Well, I don't really like, don't really care much for the straight blade fork, even if it's better performance-wise. I just think a curved fork looks better. So I search high and low for an older model Colnago fork on eBay, but I couldn't find any with a long enough steer tube. So that's when I called John and I said, hey John, if I buy an old fork, can you switch out the steer tube? And he said, well, yeah, but why don't I just make you a new fork? And I was like, well, you know, isn't there something special about the original steel forks? And I mean, isn't there something better about them? And he's like, well, you know, we can use Columbus steel. We can curve it however you want, use whatever fork crown you want, whatever, whatever kind of steer tube. I was thinking, you know, let's go with that. That sounds good. So we ordered new old stock uh, Campagnolo dropouts. We ordered the Columbus uh, tubing for the fork blades. But then because we were going full custom, I got to choose the fork crown and I picked a Chinelli style fork crown which wasn't really a fork crown offered by Colnago, but I just think they look wonderful. So I said, let's do the Chinelli fork crown. So we had a, so I had John build, he built a Chinelli fork crown and a long steer tube, but he didn't thread it yet. 
he said, why don't you take it home, make sure it fits and see where you want and then we can. So when I got it home, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna go threadless. I had this, the threadless headset already in there from the previous fork that was there, the Chris King threadless headset for a one inch steer. So I said, you know what, let's just stick with threadless for now and I'll try it. And if I don't like it, I can always put some threads on there and do a, do a threaded headset. So that's how we ended up here where we are with this really cool fork. I took the fork over to a place in Sacramento. I talked a little bit about that in one of my videos, but I took it to Sherm's Plating in Sacramento and they did a fantastic job chrome plating it. And uh, I think it turned out really cool, really wonderful. And it rides really, really well. So that is the story of the bike. But before I go, I do wanna say one thing about the ride. Now I know a lot of you guys have seen me make videos where I talk mostly about steel, I talk mostly about lugs, because I love that stuff, I think it's awesome. But I want you all to know that I am not just a total Luddite. Let me show you this. Okay, so you're not gonna be able to see the whole thing, but this is a specialized Tarmac SL1 that I purchased brand new um, in 2009. And I was considered at that time to be more or less an early adopter of carbon fiber. So I want everyone to know that I'm not completely um, oblivious to carbon fiber. I understand the benefits of carbon fiber. I've, I've been, I've had this bike, I've raced on this bike. So I know what carbon fiber is. And in, in spite of knowing what it is and what the benefits are, I really do think that there's, well, first of all, I don't really think there's anything special about carbon other than it's lightweight. But I do like the ride quality and the feel of a steel frame. It is a bit heavier. So for those of you that are racing and every gram matters, then yeah, I can see why you probably wouldn't choose this bike for racing. But, but in general, for riding in general, I really do think a bike like this has just an exceptionally good ride feel. It's fun to ride. It takes you out of your real serious mindset when you're riding it. And so I just really, really enjoy uh, having a bike like this. Uh, but I wanted you guys to see this, that I'm not, I know, I get a lot of comments. People say, oh, you know, you don't know, you're just a Luddite, you know, rim brake Luddite or whatever. But I, I mean, obviously this has rim brakes on it, but I have ridden disc brakes. I have a disc brake bike, I ride carbon. I have a carbon bike. I don't ride this bike very much. This was kind of one of those uh, race day only bikes that I used to keep. Uh, so it has very low miles on it. But um, yeah, whenever I go out on a bike ride, I generally pick something that I find that I think is just more comfortable and more enjoyable to ride, and it's generally not this one. All right, everyone. So now you know the story of the Colnago, and uh, hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one.